if you are facing exponential challenges, <coughs> linear response is not going to work. So if you're thinking your private practice is going really great at the moment, and there are no competitors in the market, you may be thrown out. When you are a leader, so it's about knowing when you need to be at the front, when you want to be at the back. You will have to keep your ego out of the door and you have to have courage. So at that time, when this cabinet minister was questioning me, though I was very scared, I did not make it come on my face. I looked in her eyes and said, yes, that is what I said, minister. And welcome to second webinar of this year. And to begin with, I'm requesting Dr. Anil Srivastava, uh, President of AIOTA, to welcome everybody, Dr. Srivastava. Thank you, Dr. Huble. It is really it's my pleasure to be with you all today on the occasion of this webinar being organized by the international chapter of AIOTA under the leadership of Dr. Vijay Suple, uh, the convener and coordinator of the international chapter, and uh, his uh, board member, Dr. Karthik Mani, who has taken a lead in organizing this webinar. I emphatically welcome Dr. Harshvardhan, the key resource faculty, the resource faculty of today's webinar, uh, and the topic that, that uh, he, he has selected for his talk is healthcare leadership advocacy, tips to reposition. Now, I would like to introduce today's guest speaker, like today's speaker, uh, Dr. Harsh Vardhan. Um, Harsh is a registered health practitioner, occupational therapist, and uh, a public service official in New Zealand. He serves as a program manager for family and community health services of Ministry of Health. It's a national role to provide management, leadership, and senior advice to support the government, a government priority, informed decision making and setting of the ministry strategy directions. Currently, Hirsch manages the cross agency uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder action plan for uh, action plan for New Zealand. Hirsch is a graduate of Nirtar Katak and holds a master of management health services degree from Massey University in New Zealand. He has over a decade of experience as a clinician manager and the leader. After two successive terms, he has recently stepped down as a president of National Occupational Therapy Association of New Zealand. He is a board of um, board member of International Chapter of IOTM. Harsh has a special interest in governance, contemporary healthcare leadership, advocacy, disability, including FASD, autism. Uh, sensory processing. Hirsch enjoys mentoring students also. So I'm really happy that Hirsch is a speaker today and I give mic to Hirsch now. Okay, Hirsch, go ahead. Thank you very much, Vijay, sir. And, and thank you, Srivastava, sir. Uh, Jyotika, ma'am, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. And, um, and thanks for this uh, generous introduction. I will try to uh, upload my slides and uh, so that you are able to see. Before jumping into the presentation, I would like to say that, uh, you know, when, when I was trying to select this topic, uh, when I was asked that, do you want to do a presentation? And then I was thinking, what topic should I select? Uh, there is a risk in selecting a topic which, which, which starts with leadership. And, and the risk is that most of us who you know, clinicians who, who work, you know, most of the time we are busy in, in our lives. And when someone talks about leadership, immediately we think that, um, you know, it is about Netagiri and uh, this is for, for people who, who want to be leaders, who want to be out there. And not everyone want to be out there, you know, people, people have different personalities. Some people want to, you know, work without being in limelight. So before I start, I just want to to break this notion that leadership is not just about being a you know superhero, super person kind of person who who goes out and talks to people and looks uh, you know like like a big deal everywhere. Leadership is also about leading yourself. 
So as you will see in this slide where I'm talking about leadership styles, uh, leading yourself is about individually deciding what you want to do in your life, individually deciding where you want to go in your life, individually deciding what you do not want to do in your life. That is also very important. It's about conscious effort we, which we make to decide what we want to do, and that is leadership. And most of the time, it's about leading ourselves. And of course, you know, um, it's also about leading people. So if, if you are, you know, in your workplace, you may, you may not have a formal designation. You may not be the formal manager. People may not always report to you, but you can not naturally emerge as a leader. And there's nothing bad in that. And then sometimes you can go a level yeah. up, and that is when you lead organizations, you know, and, and in, in today's talk, especially people who, who have been, you know, in positions of head of department or, you know, at, at, at higher level, they, they would be able to relate themselves with that, leading organizations. But, but what I want to say is that leadership is not just about, you know, being a super person or a superhero. And, and anyone can be a leader. You, you can lead your own life. You do not always need a follower. So in, in, in today's seminar, we'll be, we will be touching all these points. So what does it mean to us as a practitioner? Why do we need leadership in our practice? Uh, the second aspect is when you talk about leadership styles, you can, of course, you can break it into several categories. But I have tried to bunch uh, some similar ones together. And as you will see in the slide, it talks about transactional leadership. Now here I'll give you an example. I used to work in New Delhi and I was working for a government hospital. And, uh, you know, randomly the superintendent of the hospital would come on visit, right? And whenever he came on visit, there was a peon, you know, his, his chaprasi who used to come first and who would go through the hallway, sararen, 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 sararen. So he would create a havoc, you know, like like someone is coming to inspect, right? What happens is that when you create that havoc, and clearly the leadership style, which which used to be in past and still is 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 very much dominant, is master craftsman style of leadership. So so the person who is at the top considers himself or herself as a master, and other people are are reporting to that person and working for that person. Now transactional leadership fits quite well with that. Transactional leaders are the one who looks for exceptions, who looks for faults. So this person, this, this superintendent who came to the clinic and he was looking out at all the equipment and as a new staff, I was quietly sitting, standing next to him and in a very humble, polite way. And he touched at the, it was a sanding unit. Some of you would remember, you know, in, in like one of the ADL units, you know, we used sanding unit and and he touched it like this i don't know whether you can see my video or not but still you know he, he touched it and he showed me his finger i thought he was asking me what is this so i started to explain him sir this is a sanding unit and and he got more angry you know? <laughs> and i was not able to understand what 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 he's saying right uh, anyway so my assistant who was standing next to me said uh, you know that he is trying to tell you that why there's dust on this equipment. So basically he was trying, not interested in sanding unit, he was more interested in the dust on the equipment. And that is what transactional leaders do. They, they lead by exception. They look for faults, they look where they can pick on things, and then they intervene. They never proactively intervene. Yeah. So uh, I'm giving you just example to, this example to just, uh, and uh, to give you an idea of what it is about being a transactional leader or a master craftsman style leader. Now then there is there is a other group of leadership and I have bunched them all together. It is transformational, authentic and leadership by network. And I'll give you another example. So this person, again, uh, when I came to New Zealand and after working for, for a few years, we had a CEO, chief executive officer, um, and I can name him. Um, his name is Ashley Bloomfield. Uh, if you will Google, Ash Google Ashley Bloomfield, he's world known at the moment for some reason. I'll come to back come back to it later. 
<laughs> so actually, why I'm taking his name is that, and why I'm using him as an example of transformational or authentic leadership is, someone nominated me for something, you know, and I, did, I had done a very small thing for the department. I think I had cleaned the fridge, it had something rotten in it, and no one had identified, uh, fired it. I looked at the back and I saw that this needs to be clean. I just did it. Uh, I did not wait for uh, the cleaner to come. I did it myself. So one of my colleagues, uh, I don't know, maybe she she liked it, and she nominated me for a weekly, uh, they, they call it here chocolate fish. So someone will nominate you, and uh, you will get a chocolate fish, a very small thing. It's not a big certificate or anything. It's, it's just a recognition of something you have done. So Ashley, he was the CEO. He came with that chocolate fish, and I was not there. My manager said that, um, you can leave the chocolate fish, I'll deliver it to her. She said, no, I want to come back again. So he came back another day. Uh, so he comes back next day. And again, I was not there. Now, I because I was not there because I was in the visit, you know, in those days I used to go on community visit for occupational therapy related work. So I was getting nervous that this CEO is coming to me every now and then, and you know, I'm not there and I was getting nervous. You know, he would be thinking that, do I ever come to work or I'm always there out in the community. So he came for the third time. Still, I was not there. So I emailed him and said, Ashley, can I come and meet you? So I went and met him and we spent some time together, nearly 15, 20 minutes. But the impression Ashley left with me is something which still motivates me. Ashley Bloomfield anyways moved on and now he is the Director General of Health of New Zealand. So that, that is the highest post in, in the Ministry of Health. And when I wanted to join the ministry, the motivation was from Ashley because I, I was impressed by his transformational leadership. So transformational leaders, are they will motivate you. They have some kind of charisma in them. They will inspire you. They are intellectually stimulating. You will look at them and see like, oh, I want to be like that person. That person is my role model. A transformational leader may not have always a, a designation, you know, in, in, in an organization. That transformational leader can be your colleague, your senior, sometime your junior, right? Doesn't need to be senior all the time. You can get impressed by even someone who's junior to you. And, and they have individualized consideration. So taking Ashley's example, he was the CEO. I was, I was just, you know, a, a clinician working in this big district health board hospital. Ashley's pew never came and said, you know, sarare, sarare, sarare. but still he commands respect. He has authenticity. So if you will Google Ashley Bloomfield, he's all over in the media now because New Zealand is one of the best, you know, uh, the, one of the countries in the world we have handled COVID-19 really well. Life is really normal, even in COVID-19 situation in New Zealand. And it all credit goes to, and of course, teamwork is there, but Ashley is a leading from front. And he's authentic because I, I remember listening to him when he was, was doing a presentation. And you will find it on Google where one of the media person asked him that, you know, when you come for these, these meetings where you have to face media and you have to give answers about COVID-19, do you feel nervous? And there he talks about, you know, yes, I do get nervous. And, and and how I manage my nervousness, how I manage my mental health. But this is called authenticity. And authentic leaders are those who look genuine to people. They do not present themselves as superheroes. They look like natural people. And people can connect to them. And while I'm talking this to you, I'm sure you might have come across people in your life who would have influenced you in some way or the other. You may have seen transformational skills in them. You may have seen authenticity in them. Now, leadership by network. And, and, and this is where we are going in future. Why leadership of, by network is important, especially for health professionals and occupational therapists, is we are moving towards a health system which will no more, which, which will no more be based on hierarchy. You know, it will be, it is going to be a flat system where every individual, every health professional has an equal say. And I'll come back to, back to this again. But before that, I want to touch this. Another interesting slide It is about power dynamics. The role power, the role power is about power which you command with your position in an organization, right? If, if someone is head of department, that person has got role power. If someone has... Uh, 
is is ceo in an organization that person has role power someone is director or you know it's about the position it's about the designation then expert power most of the clinical people like you know like clinical practitioners and even academic academics their power is in their knowledge and they use their knowledge to influence things they use their knowledge to to make an impact but then there is something called connection power and it is very important for for us to to know about connection power because where we are moving towards the healthcare is moving more towards network and that is where the next slide and so as you can see in that first picture you know talking in terms of health system director i'm talking in an indian context right you have got a director most probably that person would be a, a a medical practitioner or or a doctor or whatever and then you will have junior consultants and then you will have so so there is a hierarchy and it's everywhere it's not just in india in 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 any country around the globe there is a hierarchy there will be a consultant there will be junior consultants there will be registrars and then there will be clinicians therapists so that hierarchy exists where we are heading and and where the future of healthcare go is going it is more about network so in future it has already started around the globe and very soon realizing back home in india and the network we call it complex adaptive system and that is where the healthcare is leading a uh, complex adaptive system is something like you know if you see a flock of birds <clears throat> going in the sky and they they move in a pattern right and they all are doing their jobs every bird is flying they are not looking at each other but they are so well coordinated that they, they are still able to make that pattern and maintain it similarly in health system we all have a role whether that person is a medical practitioner or or a physiotherapist or occupational therapist where we do a mistake is that we we tend to think that we are the only one who can make difference right and yes for example our profession occupational therapy it is a great profession i have no doubt about it we have got one of the best research evidence to back up what we do but so are other professionals too and so are other professions too so going forward how the healthcare is going to be it will be more like all the professional groups and not just health professions and and i'll come to this in the next slide maybe it's it's basically the solutions of healthcare lie even outside the health system and they all have to work together to take this forward and and this slide talks a, a bit more about power dynamic and it's basically a new prescription of power why i'm talking power more and more is because it relates to how you influence people it relates to how you influence people around you how we influence your consumers and how you are able to drive a change so it's very important to understand this dynamic so you know we talked about that uh, old uh, master craftsman style of leadership uh, that is no more relevant and in today's society you may have a, a, a positional power that you may be a director or ceo of an organization but that does not guarantee that you'll be able to drive change for example prime minister modi you know he i, I do follow indian media so i'm quite aware of what's happening at uh, this time and so he wants to build a new parliament and uh, and but just prime minister saying that i want to make a new parliament it's not going to happen power dynamic is is also situational you'll have to think about the situation in which situation you are at the moment you have to scan the horizons you have to scan the the topography and then you have to figure out where does who are my allies who are going to help me in this change who are the resistors who are going to resist me i'll give you an example when um, well new zealand is a, is is a considerably small country and and in terms of one of our neighbors i will not name the country just to maintain that confidentiality because i know this is getting re recorded and it will go live uh, so basically as i said new zealand is a small country and we have got occupational therapy association at that time i was president of the association 
So we wanted to develop our CPD programs and we wanted to have collaboration with a big country and which is quite big, at least four or five times bigger than New Zealand, even more than that, I would say. And their association is quite big. So we wanted to travel to that country. We wanted to attend their conference so that we can build that relationship. When you talk about situational power, I had some kind of situational power being president of the association. But at the same time, the other side, they were more powerful than us because they were a bigger country, big organization, more budget and, and so on. Right. So situational power was not very much which we could use in that scenario. Then it was about relational power. Relational power is more you develop that when you interact with people, when you make network, when you go and talk to people and try to understand who are your allies, who can resist you when you want to drive a change. And the change we wanted to drive was we wanted to motivate that country to share their CPD platform, CPD training and webinar platforms with our members. And why it was challenging, it was challenging was because we also wanted them to open those webinars for our members at a discounted rate, which would be similar to the rate they give to their, their members, right? So of course, then we had to look at who are our allies now, one of the allies we could see was the president of the association, right? I had never met that person, but but I knew that that person can can be helpful. One of the barriers which we figured out was the CEO. So, you know, president is the governance head and then CEO is the one who, who basically does the work. And the CEO, CEO was, was a non-OT, so sh 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 that person was not an occupational therapist. <coughs> and had quite a, a, an interesting opinion on things. So when we were going in the flight and we were discussing and, and our executive director and, and I, we were sitting next to each other and, and uh, Peter is his name and he says to me that, you know, like, uh, what do you think, Harj? Do you think we should be, we will be able to get from them what we want? And he had a list of things that he wanted from them. So I said to him that, look, it's not about what, we want from them, I think they would like to know what we can give to them. And uh, because that is what happens when you are using relational power, you will have to think about it's not about what I can take from that person. You have to also think about what is that I have in me, which will motivate that person to have that business transaction with me or to listen to me, to my ideas, you know, and and that is what we did. We we had a list of things we wanted to offer to them. We made a list of things. We went there like we were really doing well in advocacy. So that is that was we were having a private practitioner toolkit which they did not have. And and we had that those meetings and we we broke a deal there. Anyways, third third point is dynamic. So sometimes leaders think that well I have influence at workplace people they all respect me i can influence them i can motivate them to do things which i want to you know which i think is good for the team and it can be you know something like a, a new therapy idea or, or a new approach you want to use with your clients you know say for example uh, autism you know if you have got a a, a new uh, therapeutic model which you want to roll out in your clinical practice within the team you know you need to influence people and that is where you 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 use your leadership style right and and say you, if you, you are successful in, in in rolling that out sometimes what we forget is the environment is dynamic and things change so today your team members they are all happy with what you have suggested they want to ad adopt that, that change but this may not be like go on forever after two, three, four months, the dynamics may change. There would be new players. There will be new resistors. You will, you will have to make new allies to, to carry on with your influence, right? And, and why I'm talking more about influence is influence for good, influence to make change, which is going to bring, ultimately going to serve your consumers or, or your patients. This is 
in a nutshell, what I wanted to say is, is that power does not come just from a position or, or an authority. Power comes from your relationship with others. It comes with network. It is dynamic. It changes so continuously. You have to think how you are influencing things. Now, qualities of leadership, and, and, and these these four qualities, you know, this is something not. It, it is not my thought at all. You know, I. Uh, so this person, Chai Chua, uh, Chai Chua, is he's former Director General of Health of New Zealand, right? So he is. He has done. He has been one of the transformational leaders, and he has done lots of work. And you can go to his website. Actually, you can note it down. He has written many articles. He has written a book. In fact, I was having a conversation with him this morning, and I said to him, "Chai, are you happy for me? Your thoughts in my presentation?" And he was very pleased because he now he's retired. He's around 62 or 63. But he wants to support uh, people and, and he wants to share his ideas and he wants to support people in their leadership journey. And so Chai is quite happy for you if you're attending this webinar. Uh, if you want to contact him and you can just give my reference or you can say you attended the seminar, he will be happy to connect to you. He's on LinkedIn and, and, and he, he, will, he can talk to talk about, you know, he can carry on this discussion with you. Now, coming back to these four qualities, first quality of the leadership is desire to contribute. Now, I remember, and why I'm sharing this is, I remember five or six years back, you know, I was, at that time, you know, I wanted to do something. I wanted to bring a change. I wanted to contribute. You know, I, but I did not know how to do it. So I was talking to all these <laughs> leaders around me, and one of the leaders, which I could see was, and this is what happens when you are working as a clinician. Your immediate leader you see is your boss, right? You see the head of department, and you go to. So I went to this person and I said, uh, "Look, I, I want to contribute. I want to lead, and I want to, you know, make an impact. Uh, I'm doing my work with my clients, but I want to create an impact, and and so that what I'm doing is." not affects only one or two person, but it, it affects the society at a wider level. So her immediate you know, question to me was, so what do you want to become? Do you want to become a head of department? Do you want to become director? Do you want to become CEO? And I was not too sure about that. Because in my mind, I was not thinking about a, a, a position, right? I was thinking about, I have to contribute. So that is the first quality of leadership. And, and, and this is, thinking, so what do I want to contribute for? For example, as a clinician, you would like to maybe set up a new therapeutic pathway for someone with spinal cord injury, you know, and that can be your leadership. You maybe you want to set up a new transition to school program for children with autism, and, and that can be something you want to contribute. So it doesn't need to be always related to, to position. It, it's also about how do you contribute to make the society better. The second thing is teamwork. And uh, I remember, you know, even in when I was working, I was, I was studying in Nirtar. Um, I had, you know, there were a few people who always want to, wanted to be the opener, right? So whenever there's a cricket match, they will be the first one to take the bat and, and, and wanted to open. Leadership is about teamwork. Sometimes you are at the front. Sometimes you're at the back. So you can lead from the front, and sometimes you will need to go at the back. So it's about knowing when you need to be at the front. It's about knowing when you want to be at the back. And I'll give um, Vijay, sir, I will take your example. You are a convener of um, our international chapter. And I have seen you, your quality is you lead, you lead, you know, when it is needed, you're at the front. But then you are also at the back, and and a classic example is today. You know, you have got a, a vast experience, and and you know, but you know, you always you you present yourself in a humble way. And for example, this talk, you you could have done this talk, you know, but you wanted to give me this opportunity to go at front and and do it for you. So that is what leadership is about. It's not always being in front. You will have to always change your position. 
minimal ego now ego is 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 something which you know it, it can kill people really i remember when as a leader if you want to lead lead the society lead a team or even lead yourself you will have to compromise with your ego and i was remember you know i remember there was a time at that time i was not working for the ministry of health here i was in the association and uh, i was president of the association and we were advocating for a cause and what was happening is that children with disability the government funding system was too tough for children in comparison to adults so for example if you wanted a wheelchair cushion for a child you had to do a whole lot of paperwork in comparison to an adult and of course there were own rationales they said that it is too expensive for children you have to customize things so it costs more so that's why we uh anyway so at that time i was as an advocate in touch with some officials in the ministry of health right and i went to talk to this person and of course they had to they changed some of the rules not all the rules i we were able to influence them to change some of the rules but then i met this this official in some other meeting i approached her and said hi how are you but when she replied to me it was a very rude reply she did not even offer her hand she just said to me oh i know i know i know you we have met before and so it was a very bland and a very rude reply and that is what you have to always keep in mind when you are a leader you will have to keep your ego out of the door and srivastava sir i i know you know you you are one of those leaders who who have you know like you have led occupational therapists for years and i'm sure you would be able to relate to it when when you are a leader there are times you have to compromise your ego and you will come across people who will who will try to uh, bog you down or but but leadership is about sometimes you have to just do it so when you are making decisions it's not about you are making decisions just for your ego you are making decisions also for the benefit of others courage is very important well i'll i'll go back to to my student days because my um, my guru is here today mukashi sir and uh, i'm i'm glad you know for for as a student you know it's it's a big 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 day for me because when you feel proud that when when your teacher you know is there attending uh, a webinar and someone you have always looked high to and i'll write to give and and sorry mukai sir I, i i won't make you feel embarrassed and but still i want to give you this example you know as i was saying leadership is not not just about leading a team or a country or or an organization it's about personal leadership so when i first time got in ot in occupational therapy first year was full of frustration so i basically ran away and i wanted to reappear for medical entrance two two three months or four months i was not even doing classes of course i could not clear the medical entrance exam and then i was thinking how do i go back right and i was all these thoughts are in my mind were in my mind should i go back what will you know teachers think and they will think that you know i'm uh, but anyway i i gathered courage and i went and i went to see you mukashi sir if you remember <coughs> and uh, sir asked me where were you i said um, well i was preparing for medical entrance and uh, then sir said so why are you back i said uh, well i'm back because i i just want to be back and he said oh, will you go again next year for the exam i said no then he said why why not and i was like yes because at that point i had made a decision that i'm not going back i want to be an occupational therapist and that was the honest decision which i had made and i said to him and and the great thing was that he trusted me and and then actually he said that okay you have to write an application and i said what do i write sir and um, he said well, you think about what you want to write <laughs> because uh, you want to write the uh, something you want to write in the application you cannot say that you have you are preparing for medical entrance right so anyways i will not go further than that but i i stayed and and he showed trust in me and that was a decision that was and i think that was one of the most courageous decision which i made in my life and the decision was no matter what happens i'm not going back 
to sit for medical entrance because I am in. And this is the courage. Why I'm giving this example today is that I have seen sometimes students, they fail to take this courageous decision. Throughout their career as an occupational therapist student, they keep thinking, oh, we are in wrong profession. We should leave it. You know, if you want to leave it, leave it. Once you're in, you are in. And have the courage <coughs> to carry yourself, lead through it, and then look for ways in which you can progress. And of course, in coming slides, I'll, 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 I'll get to it. Another, another example of courage is, as a leader, sometimes you, you have to do is, uh, now I was doing a submission to a select committee in a parliament. And basically the submission was, and there's a link to that submission at the end of one of the slides takes you to that link. The submission was basically about that schools do not have, schools in New Zealand do not have enough support for children and young people <coughs> with autism, dyspraxia and dyslexia. So that is the submission I was making. At the time, this person was in, in the government, one of the cabinet ministers, and she has got a reputation of being quite strict. She used to m manage a, a very tough portfolio back then. She looked at me in, 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 a, in a very um, interesting way and says, and that is all, when you are advocating, when you are leading, people will sometimes intimidate you. you know? and, and she looked at me and says, so you are saying that government is not giving enough support to, this, to these children. So I looked back into her eyes. Now, I'm not trying to say that I'm a super person. I was not scared. I was scared. I was anxious. My heart was beating high. My feet were trembling. And I was feeling like I'm flying in the air because here is a cabinet minister sitting opposite to you and she is questioning you in a very threatening way. That is about leadership. You have to have courage. courage having courage does not mean that you are fearless. You will still have fear. Anxiety is, and fear is natural. So when you go and appear in an exam, in an interview, and your heart starts beating and your feet starts trembling, that is natural. So leaders do not need to be <laughs> supernatural. But courage is, in spite of those fears, in spite of those anxieties, how can you manage that to lead? So at that time, when this cabinet minister was questioning me, though I was very scared, I did not make it come on my face. I looked in her eyes and said, yes, that is what I said, minister. And that's it. And there was a silence. And nothing happened after that. Right. So, so these four qualities, desire to contribute, teamwork, minimal ego, and courage. Something to keep in mind. Now, this diagram, I don't know when you look at this, whether you are able to relate it to something or not. You know, think about an idea you had in your team. Maybe as a student, you know, you, you thought about something, maybe doing a freshers party or, or doing a <clears throat> farewell party, or you had an idea and you wanted to influence people. And then you will have people at different stages when you want to influence change. Initially, when you put an idea forward, there will be a denial. Then there will be a fear. There will be resistance, anger depression, then people start to explore, and then acceptance and commitment comes. It happens everywhere, right? It happens in personal life. 10 years back, and I'm giving my personal example here, when, when I first time I went to see my would-be father-in-law, uh, and that was again a courageous decision to do that, and I wanted to ask a hand of his daughter uh, for marriage, and all these things happen at the time. So, so it's not just about leadership in an organization. It's about in a personal life. You know, you, you might experience all these things happen. You have an idea in your mind. It's not that when you talk about that idea, immediately people will jump up and say, yeah, we want to do it. People go through that phase and it's okay. Leadership is about understanding that people will not accept you, all your ideas all of a sudden. They need time. Leadership about, is about being empathetic, you know, so that you, when people are going through that journey, you are working, you're working alongside that person 
through that journey for acceptance. So I, I remember uh, in our district health board when I was leading a program back then, and that program was called Choosing Wisely. And of course, in the coming slides, I will talk more about it. So one of the projects in the program was related to concussion in emergency department. Now we wanted the doctors, the, the physicians in, in the emergency department to use a specific tool <coughs> to screen for concussion. What we had discovered is when there was a new patient coming to the emergency department, they used to do all sorts of assessment, but they were not doing a screening for concussion. And concussion, as you know, it may be invisible. So if you are hitting into a car at the speed of 100 kilometers per hour, you may have visible broken bones, but you may have invisible injury inside your head, which is difficult to see. So we wanted these doctors to use that screening tool. First time I went into the department, they looked, into the, looked at the tool and they said immediately, no, we are not using it, we don't have time. They denied to even look at the tool. And then we had to work, it took us around one year to go through that cycle and, and, and to go through that phase of, so initial it was denial, no, it doesn't work. And then there was a resistance, a group of doctors saying, no, no way we are using it. And then they started to explore. They, to, they started to explore that, okay, we cannot do it. Can we ask a nurse to do it? Can we ask some other professional to do it? And, and then gradually there was an acceptance and ultimately they were able to use that tool. They employed a, a specialist nurse who was using that tool with all these patients. So I would say keep that diagram in your mind because you can apply it even in small scale, you can apply it at, 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 at a larger scale. Now this, this one, this slide, this is about exponential growth and linear response. Now there is a story and uh, this story is about Lord Krishna goes to this king as uh, in, in disguise. So this king did not know that this person is Lord Krishna, right? And he says, okay, so I've come to you, to you and what you can offer to me. And king said, look, I have got heaps of money. Just tell me what you want. You know, I can give you gold coin and this and that. Lord Krishna said, well, how many gold coins you have got? And said, heaps. Just tell me how much you want. So Lord Krishna said, okay, so what I want you to do is that there are 64 squares in a chess board, okay, 64 squares. I don't play chess, just to let you know. I'm not a great chess player, just using an example. So he said that, okay, so you have to, so if you put one coin in the first square, in the next one, you have to make it exponential. So two, the next one you have to make square root of two, square root of four. So you keep on going. And the king thought, oh, it's as simple as that. And he agreed to it. But when he finally, the amount which came, so that is called exponential growth, you know? And exponential growth is quite real. Kodak is, is, is a camera company. We all know the name and, and I'm sure you might have used Kodak camera uh, in past. Now, first time the developers of digital camera, they had approached Kodak. And in those days, there were films. You could, you know, you had special kind of films. And, and of course, then you had to wait for all those 36 or 37 photos to be clicked. And then you go to the developer and then you, but now you, you all know in your phone, you can, you can make a click and, and you take a picture. And you can make yourself really look smart, slimmer and everything you can do. So Kodak had got an offer for someone who had come up with this idea of digital camera. And at the time, the developers of Kodak, the management, the board of directors of Kodak said, this is rubbish. We already have got a strong market. We don't need you guys. So they were thrown out the door. So coming back to this, this, this diagram. So this is again made by Chai. Uh, remember, the, the former director general of health. And he has sketched it by himself. So after retiring, retirement, he is doing lots of sketches, right? And this is one of the sketches he has made. And he used COVID-19 as an example. When there is an exponential growth, as you look into this, this graph, x-axis is the time frame, y-axis is the change. 
in the initial few years, there is a deception stage. You do not you do not see that that change is happening. It's not visible. You are still working in your linear way, but that there comes a point that is called tipping point, and that is where Kodak comes. It is also called Kodak moment. Right? You you remember that advertisement Kodak used to have Kodak moment. Now Kodak moment is it's about that is the time when Kodak got offered to take that technology of digital camera. They missed that opportunity, right? They missed it. They thought it's useless. And then after that, the, the market of digital camera grew exponentially. Kodak was having linear response. So they were not creating new market, basically. They're trying to sustain their market. They thought that they will always rule. Nokia phone. They thought they will always rule the market of phones, right? They were thrown out by BlackBerry, and BlackBerry were thrown out by iPhone, and iPhone, who knows, someone will throw them out too. <clears throat> so the point I'm trying to say is that change is exponential, especially this diagram talks about COVID-19. Before COVID-19, if you talk to people about these concepts, they will say that it is useless, you know, it will never happen in healthcare. It happened with Kodak, it will happen. COVID-19 has taught the world that disruptions can be exponential. So COVID-19 is a disruption, right? Disruption can be good or bad. Disruption made by a digital camera was a good disruption, actually. It gave society uh, a tool where you can click your photo, you can send it to your family and friends and, and heaps of things you can do on it, right? So the point here is, if you are facing exponential challenges, <coughs> linear response is not going to work. So if you're thinking your private practice is going really great at the moment, and there are no competitors in the market, you are the best private provider in the world, in, in, in your locality at least, you know, you may be thrown out by someone who is in the deception stage. You have not noticed that person. I'll come to that. I'll come in the next slide. So it's always being aware of what is happening and the potential of exponential disruption and how you are going to tackle it. Here I go to the next slide. You know, as occupational therapists, as 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 health professional, we get taught to think in a linear way most of the time, you know. And we think A leads to B, B leads to D. Lead. That is how we think. I remember as, as a student, you know, I, I went in a viva and uh, where you get grilled, you get asked questions. So I got a case study of Volkman's ischemic contracture. Now, the name itself was too hard to remember. You know, the other thing hard to remember was to to know all the nerves and 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 muscles in in your hand, and which contract and you know about Volkman's ischemic contracture, right? So, anyways, I was asked, uh, so which muscles get impacted? So I, I said the names. Uh, which nerves get impacted, so I was able to tell the names. And then I was asked, so what do you think? First the nerves get impacted or first the muscles get impacted? <coughs> you know, and, and then, so you see, that is how we think. We, we go in a linear way. We always think that the world works in a linear way, and that is how most of the health professionals get trained. Include not only OT, I'm saying, it is, you know, any, any health profession. We think in a mostly in the linear way. Where we are heading in future, where the health system is heading, it's called systems-based approach, systems thinking. And as you can see in the diagram, systems thinking is not always A leads to B and B leads to C and C leads to D. World doesn't work like that. It's a complicated system, as I said earlier, complex adaptive system. So instead of wasting time on whether the nerve got affected or, or the muscle got affected, it would be more useful if we think about this patient who came to us today. Did he eat this morning? Where did he sleep? Which hotel is he staying in? Has he got enough money? If not, where is he bringing money from? If he has got enough money, what else he can, we can provide to him? You know, is he going to work? or he's not going to work? Has he got children? If he has got children, what is the impact of his disability on children? So 
it is way more complex than just A to B to C to D. So that is the point I'm trying to say is problems in health, they are not linear. They are exponential. And if you if you want to tackle them, it's about systems thinking. And that is where we are heading, right? Now, I'm, I want to give example of this program because this is the program which I'm leading at the moment for uh, the Ministry of Health in in New Zealand. Right, and so this is about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder action plan, and we are doing things, but at the same time, we are working along with, it's not only the Ministry of Health who are working, but we have got that systems approach where we are working with Ministry of Education, Ministry of Justice for Children, that is a remand home, uh, corrections, that is prison, New Zealand Police, Health Promotion Agencies, a number of agencies are coming together and working and trying to create solutions for these children and young people and people affected by fetal alcohol. So fetal alcohol is basically when mothers drink alcohol, babies are born with some kind of head injury, which may not be visible, but then of course it presents and it impacts your life right from when you're young to when you're adult. So this is one example which I wanted to give about how you work in a in a systems approach. So going back to the slide, I will not skip it. I just wanted to 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 give a context of your practice. So as a private practitioner, for example, if you're working in, in your city, you have to think about what other things you are doing. Where are you collaborating with other people? Are you collaborating with schools? Are you collaborating with uh, who maybe recreational places? Are you collaborating with uh, local government? So you have to think about all these things. Another another way to to deal with dual transformation is thinking about. Sorry, another way to do to 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 deal with exponential change is the concept of dual transformation. So dual transformation says, for example. There, there are things we do which makes good services better. So when you are in the transformation A place, for example, if you have got a clinic and you think to, to have a new assessment tool, maybe you want to use SIPT, a sensory integration and praxis test, right? And you get that test. After a few months, you feel like, no, I should also have ADOS, that is autism diagnostic test. And then after a few years, you realize, no, we should have Griffiths for developmental assessment. So you are making good services better. And that is you are transforming today. You are strengthening today. You are sustaining in the market. Remember, you're not creating new markets, right? But dual transformation approach says that when you are strengthening today, at the same time, you should be creating tomorrow. So basically, one group of your, your team or your or your business or your private practice is working on today but this other group is trying to create tomorrow and what will be tomorrow tomorrow is more about the new markets which you can use and um, a classic example is of singapore um post you know in in 2000 between 2000 and 2010 most of the postal uh, agencies around the world they they really struggle and many lost businesses and it's, in new zealand for example you know they used to deliver letters every day now they do it only three days a week because they cannot afford not many people are using letters these days but singapore post flourished you know why because they sensed that an uh, exponential disruption is going to take place and that exponential dis dis disruption was due to internet due to emails way ahead back in early 90s they realized that internet has come in existence in future people are not going to use us so what should we do at that time itself they created a different arm and that is where transformation b is so transformation B team starts looking for, so okay, so what new services I can provide? What new markets I can create? 
and they decided that okay we will not just deliver letters and parcels we will also provide operational services uh, in business term they they call it logistics so we will buy product we will not just be carriers of products but we will buy products we will transport them from one part of singapore or world to the other part so here comes 2010 most of the postal agencies around the world lost their business singapore post flourished because at the right time they are able to they were able to create tomorrow right this is one example similarly netflix now blockbuster is a company which was very popular you know in in, in western world and used to go and and uh, you know video video cassettes and all if you remember vcr and vcp days when you go and buy video cassettes and or you rent a uh, a video cassette so blockbusters were having very big market at that time netflix had approached blockbuster and said look you guys are do- doing really well do you want to get to, do you want to have our idea and netflix had come up with an idea that they will actually <laughs> deliver these video cassettes there will be home delivery of video cassettes all right so they wanted to do home delivery and blockbuster said rubbish uh, we don't believe in it we already have got established business people come to us why will go door to door to deliver anyways they did not buy netflix and you see what has happened blockbuster no one knows them now they're out of the market netflix have got trillions of dollars of market netflix have until now uh, until recently they were just you know in entertainment and they were still using you know um the movies and 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 serials produced by others but now they are producing their own movies and who knows after 10 years you will see netflix will be in a totally new new space they might be doing real estate they might be doing web development similarly amazon if you take example of amazon they started with selling of of services and products on online platforms and now transformation b is on your facebook you might be getting those advertisement about amazon web services so the point what i what i want to which i want to why i'm discussing it here if you are thinking that why i'm talking about this companies is now you have to think where are you in terms of your practice where are you in terms of your clinic your business are you in the transformation a stage where are you going in future is there any potential exponential growth which is going to happen in future covid-19 is one of the things what other things can happen in future now i don't know whether you are aware or not but three big companies amazon and jp morgan and berkshire these three big companies have joined hand together and they want to target the well-being market so a totally new product so they're not talking about we are going to provide services to people who are sick they are talking about we want to provide services for health and well-being especially after covid-19 you will see that the focus will be more on well-being so it's not about providing health services to people who are sick but also to people who want to be healthy and now these companies and and you know who is the ceo of that company his name is atul gawande i would really encourage you to go and google atul gawande dr atul gawande is a uh, he's from maharashtra and uh, he is based in us and he is a very well known physician he has written a book called being more mortal and if you like reading books please go and read it he talks about elderly care and and the future of elderly care and how that impacted his father and end of life care and gazala ma'am you you might have heard about him and you have done lots of work um end of life care So yeah if if you get time read about Atul Gawande and Atul Gawande has been appointed as the CEO of this team of three companies and they are going to design a platform a health platform which would be targeting on well-being the name is haven h a v e n the website is not very well developed but they are doing work they will be able to so again coming back to you so what are you thinking about future Uh, i was thinking about a few things which look i cannot give uh, you know a cookbook answer to what you should be doing 
But have you thought about the parents who come to see see you with your children? Because you have got lots of influence with them. Where do they go on holidays? What is about their well-being? Where do they live? Where do they want their children to live when they grow up? Who will care for the children when there will be no more? What about their siblings? What well-being services you can provide to their family? You know, and services, the transformation B, which I'm talking about is not only about health. You have to think about services outside health and it can be totally new thing. Singer is the company who used to make sewing machines. And then what happened is that, you know, uh, people no more sew at home. We all buy ready-made garments. They realized at the right time. So they created another team who were working on tomorrow while they were still profiting on today. And that team was preparing medical equipment. So look, this company who was, who was preparing sewing machine, they are into medical equipment. One of the leading medical equipment provider in the world is Singer. So think about not just about health, think about what other things you can do, how you will reposition your business. And capability link is, while you are still working to make good services better at the same time you are creating tomorrow and once you have created your tomorrow gradually that tomorrow becomes your today so you start working on the edges right on the fringes the edges if you get some success you scale it and gradually who knows you will not be working with autism you will not be working with cerebral palsy because you will be looking for wider market you will be working for big firms you will be working for well-being provision to corporates you will be working for <clears throat> well-being of children in big schools so widen your horizon think about future if you will not do it someone else will do it because disruption will happen and that is what history has taught us correct uh, coming back to choosing wisely and uh, this is again, you know, as as clinicians, we think that evidence based practice is, is something we have to do. And yes, we have to do evidence based is, is really important. Where we are heading to the future. So health, you know, health, health services has grown with time and developed with time. We started with in, in early 20s and 30s when it, the concept was anything you provide free of cost is the best health service, you know. But then we, we came, a time came when it was about, we started to talk about sanitation and, and how personal hygiene and, and maintaining cleanliness and all that in society is going to prevent diseases. So we, we started to talk about prevention. And then we started to talk about evidence-based practice in 90s. And nursing was one of the first professions who talked about them. And then we started to talk about how to do more with less you know, lean management principles and all. Now the future we are going to is, is talking about what does our customer value? So I gave this example last time, and uh, this is again not my example. Sir Mu Gray, he is at uh, Gazala Mam. You would know him. He is based in UK, a central center for evidence-based medicine. And his talk <coughs> is really powerful. He talks about like say one person goes to the surgeon and says, you know, I want to have my knees replaced. The surgeon says that, OK, why do you want your knees to be replaced? And he says, look, I want to do I've got osteoarthritis and I want to do gardening. I cannot squat because for gardening I need to squat. Well, there is lots of evidence that you can change the knee. You know, one of my friends who is an orthopedic surgeon in New Delhi, he says, and he says, if you'll throw a stone in New Delhi, it will definitely land on one of an orthopedic surgeon who does knee replacement. So it's everyone does knee replacement. There's a strong evidence that you can replace knee. But here comes the point. The doctor says to the patient, now do you realize, Mr. So-and-so, if I operate your knee, you will never be able to squat. He said, no, I didn't know that. Yes, with a replaced mm. knee, you will never be able to squat. So maybe what that person did, he went to someone like you and me, and uh, they were able to raise their planting bed, or we got planter or a pot, a raised height. You can stand and do gardening rather than squatting. So though there was an evidence that surgery works, but that was not serving the purpose, that was not meeting the value of the customer or the consumer what they wanted. So when you are practicing, 
you have to think about not just about evidence base. You have to think about what does my consumer want. Now the consumer wants you to help the child in transition to school, but you started talk up. You start to talk about you know sensory integration therapy and 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 uh, you know it's not going to match. You have to somehow work. You have to work on both the ways. Yes, you will do sensory integration therapy or your therapy, but at the same time, you have to look at how is that going to help in transition to school. So you have to look at what values to the customer, and this is what is about choosing wisely. There is lots of evidence to do things, but just having evidence does not matter. And this is just an example from uh, I was involved in this choosing wisely movement. This is an international movement. And we did lots of work. You can go online and and look for more information on choosing wisely what it is. <laughs> uh, the point which I really wanted to touch, and I know we have got limited time. I started a bit late, so I will take additional ten minutes if if that is okay uh, uh, to to cover. Um, so, you know, again, as clinicians, as researchers why we get frustrated we think that why do government make decisions uh, in a way which they make you know they they will they will pay attention to only one thing at a time you know why why they do not pay attention to to other things so you would be thinking why do government why are they not interested in making occupational therapy council right or you will be thinking why mr prime minister is having interest all of a sudden in making the parliament a new parliament building or why he wants to make reforms in agriculture so decision making as clinicians what we have learned as as occupational therapists or, or health professionals we think in a rational way we think that decision making is always a, a rational process but it is not you know kingdon is a, is a person first time i came to know about him when uh, I was doing my master study and I was I was reading about a policy uh, it was a paper related to health policy and it was night and you know I did my masters quite late and and usually when you have we have got you know, a child at home and you're so busy you you get the time to read at night and I, have, I was half asleep right I was half as, asleep and I was going through this paper about kingdom and suddenly i started to read about why do decision makers pay attention to one thing rather than the other and immediately i you know i was all awake because this was so interesting coincidentally next day i i was in a clinic with a pediatrician now this pediatrician happens to be at the time he was chief advisor for the ministry of minister of health for child health right so I, at that time i was not working for the ministry he was though so during our discussion he said we talked about this is in making and he was talking about his own frustration how things happen and he said hush have you heard about garbage can and i said yes i was reading about it last night actually so garbage can model and this is in making in a in in government department is not very different from this so there's a it's like a the, the model says it's like a black box in black box you provide problems you provide solutions and then there are decision makers and people really don't know what's happened inside the box and suddenly a decision gets made so this was a concept uh, this was given by Cohen March and Oslin but actually Kingdon JW Kingdon is his name and he he said that well it is a black box but still we can you know provide some more information on on what happens we know at least something about what happens in decision making so he said you know so what is what is a problem problem is something you know there are conditions there are issues but problem is when a government decides to pay attention to one condition at a time and that goes on its agenda you know for for example uh, covid-19 that is all of a sudden on the government agenda at the time right so when you think about kingdom stream model there is something called political stream so 
political stream has nothing to do with problem, nothing to do with solution. Any political party, when they come in power, they have their own manifesto, they have their own agenda, and they will do it because they have promised to people to do it. And also, they may have their own personal agenda. So Prime Minister Modi, I'm taking his example again again uh, because I'm trying to talk in Indian context. For him, well-being is, is a big thing. He likes yoga, so yoga is in his agenda. So that is a political stream. It has nothing to do with whether yoga works or not works. It has nothing to do with will yoga solve all the health problems or not. It is because there is a personal interest there. And the philosophy of, of the government, the political party, aligns more with yoga, so they are promoting it, right? Now, the other stream is problem stream. <clears throat> the problem stream can be impacted by, say, a disaster or a crisis. And COVID-19 is, is a classic example for that, right? And so problems, if, if a problem has come on government's agenda, for example, COVID-19 or Parliament building, it was there for, for years, right? And it is quite old. It is not like it has become old all of a sudden in a month. But it has become a problem because now it is on government agenda. Before that, it was a condition. So the building was in bad condition. But now the building has become a problem because it is on the government agenda. Allied health bill, you know, it is. it was a condition. There was a condition that allied health was not regulated in India. Suddenly, it has become a problem because now it is on government's radar on their agenda. <coughs> Occupational Therapy Council, it is a condition, but it is not a problem yet for the government because it is not on their agenda. So, political stream, problem stream. Okay. Going back to politics stream, in politics stream, some are visible participants. So public servants, uh, you, you see their media or, 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 or politicians, and then there are hidden participants like specialists, academics, researchers. Now, a few months back, last month, uh, uh, Ministry of Health in India, they were doing a consultation on assistive technology, right? Now, of course, Minister of Health is, is, is visible, but the person who was chairing that review committee was not visible. He was a hidden participant. His name is Dr. R. K. Srivastava. Not, not, um, yeah, not, not like someone R. K. Srivastava. He's he's in in Ministry of Health in India, and he is leading it. No one knows about him, but he is chairing that. So they are hidden participants, and they are visible participants. Right, so being aware of that. Now, policy stream. Policy stream is more about solutions. So people have their solutions. So as an occupational therapist, you will have a solution that in COVID-19, we can help people in their mental health being. We can help children with disability to cope with the demands of COVID-19 or the online demands on the students. Uh, so what happens is that all these streams run separate to each other. They are rarely interconnected. Politicians, they have got their own thoughts. They work in that way. Problems, they will come on agenda depending on whether there is an urgency or many other factors. And policy stream is solution. People keep going, going around with their solution. So uh, now that I work for the ministry, I can see people in policy circle like researchers, academics, you will get emails from them. They will talk about the research they have done. You know, they, they, they want to promote that. They want the government to pay attention to that. But that's not going to help. There is always a, a policy window, or we call a window of opportunity that comes. <coughs> You'll have to, as an advocate, if you want to promote yourself. So usually what we think as clinicians and researchers, we think that if we do research, if we create great evidence, government is going to listen to us and do things for us. It doesn't work that way. All right. Research is important, but then you'll have to look for window of opportunities. The event, the that particular time, that is where you need to promote. So you have to keep looking for the problem. Once the problem is on agenda, 
then you have to match your solution with that problem. So at the moment, problem is COVID-19. And you have your solution ready. You keep promoting your solutions, right? Government talks about well-being. You have your solutions ready. You keep injecting your well-being solution there. So decision making is not a rational process. It's quite a complex process, but you have if you are aware of all these complexity and how you have to use that window of opportunity, then it's going to help. If you don't understand this dynamic, it is going to frustrate you. Now, people say that uh, I know in India council, OT council is, is something people want. And but this council is remember, we talked about it is dynamic. If you think you, a council will be established and, and you'll have all the solutions forever, it's not going to happen. In my view, if you want council to come on the problem list of the government or on the agenda of the government, you join the policy stream there. You go with your solutions. Instead of going to the government saying we want a council, you target each and every government department health department, ministers, and also section officers, also the, these public servants, and they do not need to be always IS officers. You can go to section officers and clerks and, and, and other people who are easily approachable sometimes. And try to influence their decisions. Try to see where do they make policy? Can I input in that policy? Once you go in that policy circle gradually, then you can move the attention towards, okay, this is then they will start recognizing you as a profession and then you can influence decisions and once that window of opportunity comes you will be able to get through so of course advocacy and and this has been one of my interests some of the articles are there some of the links are there you can go and and, and read about it um, and for example this one more doing not just Talking therapy is needed in mental health. And this is a media release which we made because the government uh, were reviewing mental health services and they did lots of, they made emphasis on psychology. So there was a window for us to go and advocate and say it's not just about talking therapies, it's about doing therapy. So you have to look for those window of opportunities when you can advocate yourself. And this media release was done when the, the, who is the current Prime Minister, Prime Minister Ardern, she was campaigning for her first election and she was talking about mental health in schools. So that was a window for us. We knew that this is on government's agenda and that was the time we made a media release supporting her view, saying, yes, um, Ms. Ardern, you are correct. There is a mental health need and occupational therapy funding should be approve uh, should be improved for that she came in power we wrote a letter to her attaching this media release and said you remember we were doing media release and then we started to work together with the government so this is how it works you will have to link your work if we were just you know doing relying on our research work uh, oh we have got research it works in schools and government will read our no one reads those journals people people sometimes they don't care what is there it's about what is there in that policy circle in that time? I'm on the webinar. And who is able to connect? I, I'm on the webinar, so, okay. There are yes, other things, and um, this is my presentation on, on the future of healthcare uh, 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 and uh, platform uh, uh, revolution. I will not go into the detail of it. Okay. There is a link to my presentation. Will, I would encourage you to go and, and see if you are interested to, you to, the to office? know more about I that. You're most welcome. And huh? I know I don't want to take more of your time. It's um, uh, I think 60 minutes now, so I'll I'll just stop there and happy to take questions. Thank you.